from the from the data set and we used the MRNet data set. Um, then we had to review to make sure that these um, MRIs were considered to not be bad data and we defined bad data as MRIs where the relevant or major anatomical structures are not present within the field of view. So then we trained a Siamese network by, by randomly selecting pairs of MRIs and inputting them into a pre-trained AlexNet and getting a one-dimensional feature vector representation for each MRI. And then we calculate the Euclidean distance between the feature vectors. But because we know that all the MRIs in the training data are normal, the ground truth Euclidean distance was equal to zero. So then during testing, we just input each MRI into the model and calculated the Euclidean distance between the input MRI and each uh, MRI in the training data so that we could get the mean Euclidean distance. And then MRIs with very high mean Euclidean distance we consider to be bad data. And you can see examples of them there on the bottom left. That's everything. Okay, thank you. And um, okay, so now we'll uh, ask Joshua to present his work quickly. Hi, I'm Josh, and I'm a PhD student from the University of Liverpool. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, the scientific community came together to find innovative solutions to various problems related to the virus. One of the biggest focuses was on the automated diagnosis of COVID-19 imaging to spot outbreaks quickly and efficiently using deep learning. We found that data sets of COVID patients were often small compared to other classes such as pneumonia or normal images. This led to some algorithms overfitting on a larger class. To combat this, we proposed a new activation function as an alternative to the sigmoid function. This greatly improved model performance but was only available on binary classification. Here we have extended our previous work to the multi-class case and present the MGV activation function. We briefly demonstrate the method on chest x-rays of three classes. The method is easily applicable to any multi-class problem with highly imbalanced classes and may provide improved performance over the commonly used softmax activation. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to discussing my work in the poster session. All right, thank you for our presentation. Um, so now, since Sonia has arrived, she can present uh, to us her work. And after that, we'll have a first batch of questions for your three papers. So Sonia, uh, the stage is yours. Uh, hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sonia. Uh, wait, let me start the video. OK. Uh, wait, the video is not working, sorry. Uh, perhaps you can present now and um, we figure out that later when someone else answers their question. Okay, so hi, I'm Sonia. I'm a PhD candidate from Université Paris-Saclay. And our here focused on weekly supervised, um, weekly supervised 3D convalescents for denoising Monte Carlo radiotherapy dose simulations. So prior to radiotherapy treatments, doctors make a simulation of the plan in radiation dose to ensure that the organs surrounding the target tumor do not get harmed. And the Monte Carlo method is the most precise tool for that today, but it's way too greedy resource-wise to use in practice. So we wanted to accelerate that. And our intuition is to consider the Monte Carlo simulation as a sequential process. So the idea was to see what a dose volume looks like when you simulate it with 10 particles, or 1,000 particles, or a million particles. And from that sequential observation, can we predict what the dose will look like when simulated with a billion particles? So what we did was we implemented a three-dimensional and uh, recurrent model based on convolutional LSTMs, and we fed the model sequences of unfinished or you can say noisy Monte Carlo simulations which did not reach convergence to infer a dose volume that looks like a properly converged one. And since the ground truth dose volumes are extremely time consuming to compute, we use the weekly supervised setting called noise to noise to train the model and then the model is trained only using a noisy but cheap to compute Monte Carlo simulation. And the code is available online, so I'll be happy to discuss in further details with you during the past sessions. Thank you. Okay, uh, we thank the speakers uh, from the first batch and start with questions. So Joel uh, said that you can post the questions in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> and um, 
we already have some questions from the study groups. And um, we start with the first paper, K1. One question from the study group was, how is the MED threshold for the outliers chosen? Um, so I think the most sensible approach that we could think of for choosing a threshold was to go to the training data and calculate the Euclidean distance between MRIs and the training data. And because they are all normal, we just took the largest Euclidean distance present in the training data and then anything above that we consider to be bad data. Okay, thank you. And we have another question for the first uh, presenter, which is how do the authors account for class imbalances? Um, yeah, so there was quite a large class imbalance. I think there was maybe seven bad data out of 739 um, in the test set. But um, we just kind of, we assessed the model using three different metrics to try to give kind of an accurate representation of how the model was performing given that the class balance was so small. We used AUC sensitivity and specificity. Okay, thank you. And one question uh, which I personally had after reading your paper was uh, how sensitive is the approach to perturbations uh, of good input data? For example, a slightly rotated scan. Would it be detected as outlier or bad data or not? Um, so yeah, that's kind of our next step that we want to see um, because that will tell us exactly like what features the model is relying on. So if we rotate an MRI and it still classifies as good, as good data, then we know that it's looking at um, you know the femur and um, the correct features it's picking up on. But if we do that and we find that it's actually classifying this as bad data, I think we'll be, you know, it'll be easily corrected by augmenting the training data. Uh, also. Okay, thank you very much. With respect to the time, I think we should go on to the next yeah, uh, we paper. Have, well, some questions for the second paper. Um, so oh, sorry. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, so to Joshua, uh, some questions for the ruling group was: um, so how does your uh, method purpose method compare to other baseline? As like. Um, is there oversampling or weighting the different classes differently in the loss? Did you compare to that? Um, yeah, uh, in three pages, um, there's not a lot of room to put all the comparisons. And it's not a criticism, so you yeah, just, yeah, yeah. just tell us what happened. Um, I, I did compare and oversampling tends to overfit at high levels of imbalance. Mm -hmm. um, but there is the option of using both as well, and mm -hmm. use oversampling and this method. And uh, that does perform uh, better than oversampling on its own anyway. But um, things like oversampling and even undersampling do kind of overfit. Um, yeah, that, even that worse definitely than makes sense at all. and also uh, correspond to some experience of mine. But yeah. now that's a really interesting um, uh, method that you propose. So um, you. one question is also, why did you speak, uh, speak specifically oh, sorry, that uh, distribution? And not another one. So it's a generalized extreme value distribution. Um, why did you choose that one exactly? Or how uh, did you come used, to that? The GEV distribution is used um, primarily for very extreme events. So um, earthquakes and hurricanes, where um, quite often you'd have just uh, very normal events. Then you mm -hmm. have to predict where there's a very a small sample of extreme events, uh, such as you might have uh, COVID-19 is a very small sample. And um, so okay, that's where that's, the inspiration is from. interesting, for. okay, that relationship with uh, other application. No, okay, that's and perhaps one last question. Um, so from the study group, how does one ensure that the um, loss theoretically mitigates class imbalance within the formulation? Um, do you have like theoretical results showing that it will do it? Or did you just find it was working empirically? Um, just empirically at the moment. Okay. Uh, I think that there will be uh, some theoretical results, I imagine. Yeah. Um, but, but you think there is a way to, you think there is a way to actually prove it um, in a more um, principled way? It might have already been proven in, in yeah. traditional okay. statistics, possibly. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I will certainly look at that in the future. 
Okay, so yeah, thank you for your answer. Okay. Uh, really inter interesting work and good job. And um, now we'll move to the papier, uh, paper from Sonia on uh, the radiotherapy. Um, just for a bit of context, uh, because I'm much less familiar uh, with that application, and I think a lot of people are not. Um, so you mentioned that you, the most accurate results that you can have come from Monte Carlo simulation, is that right? Um, but so how long does it take to do a complete one for that one? Um, Oh, we cannot hear you. Oh, it's good now. Oh. Okay. Uh, the way we generated the data set using Monte Carlo, uh, of course, we used parallelization for everything to be uh, faster. But if you put uh, the computation hours end to end, like uh, a ground truth simulation, so computed with over 100 billion particles, took like 4,000 hours to compute, mm -hmm. uh, unparalleled. So it's a lot, and that's just one patient. So mm -hmm. our cohort comprises on only 50 patients, but that was also very long to compute. Mm, okay. Uh, and so, uh, okay, no, thanks for the context. So now once trained, you can predict uh, like the irradiation in much shorter time. I assume that makes exactly important I in think, the clinical uh, setting. Yeah, the, the bottleneck for Monte Carlo is really this uh, simulation part. And I think the goal of using deep learning for this application is to, um, to, uh, to have a model that outputs a very clean dose from very, very noisy ones. And even the ones that we used in this uh, work, the noisy input doses were, to our sense, not noisy enough to be really implemented in, in a clinical practice, but it's at least uh, only a uh, just a few hours to compute mm -hmm. those. So it's a lot of uh, gaining time, indeed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the uh, idea is, yeah, the clinician will compute itself, uh, himself, uh, noisy simulation, and then you would refine it, and you would be able to do the treatment based on that. Okay. Exactly. And so uh, one question from the study group. Um, is LSTM really necessary here? Uh, Knon to model long-term interaction? Here we just have a sequence of two. So, okay, yeah, I suppose that question is about. Uh, there is a sequence a of three. Model? Hmm? I'm sorry. Ah, oh, it's actually three. You said. Yeah, it's three. But it's it's true that it's a small sequence, but um, uh, the, this is something that we want to investigate as well, and uh, as well as the noise that should be in the noisy input sequence, we want it to be the the noisiest, so the the fastest faster to compute. Uh, and uh, we used LSTMs because we really wanted to see uh, how the, we, we believe that uh, seeing the sequence of uh, aggregating the, uh, the, the dose together uh, in a sequential manner could bring uh, more information than just taking one noisy sample, put it in a unit, for example, and see the output dose. Uh, we really wanted to take advantage of this sequential uh, uh, nature uh, that is in the uh, Monte Carlo computations. So that's why we tried with LSTM, which is quite kind of uh, the go-to uh, mm -hmm. architecture in the recurrent world, oh, uh, and, and adapted to convolutional uh, it's settings. It's a sensible choice, especially as a, a first work, and then you, eventually you will refine it. Uh, so no, really, really cool work, and didn't personally know that application, but that's yeah, that's why I like middle. You see a lot of different stuff. Uh, so thank you for your time and your answer. So. Now we're done with that first batch of papers uh, to the public. You can catch up with the authors later during the poster session. And now we'll move to the three next uh, papers, uh, K4, K5, and K6. So now, Sumit, um, Sumik, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Shamik from Otto Gerig University, Magdeburg, Germany. And this work is about, it's called DS6, Deformation Aware Semi-Supervised Learning, an application to uh, small person segmentation with noisy training data. Uh, with the development of 7 Tesla MRI, we can visualize uh, the small vessels really clearly. However, for a deep learning model to automatically segment, the main problem is to have uh, sufficient enough training data. In our approach here, we try to combat the problem of um, small training data set using uh, this uh, semi-supervised approach. 
where the base, uh, the base model or the backbone model is a modified version of unit MSS or unit deep supervision. And in this model, in the first uh, pipeline, what we can see the actual data is supplied. In the bottom row, what you can see is uh, the data is transformed with uh, deformation, and then it's been supplied. And in terms of loss, we are calculating two different supervised loss. One is for the actual uh, data with the corresponding label, and also the deformed data with the deformed label. Apart from that, the same deformation or the same transformation is also applied on the prediction to get also a transform prediction to calculate a consistency loss between the transform prediction and the prediction of the transform input. And these uh, three different losses are combined together to get the final loss for the model. And in this manner, we are training this and this uh, approach has been trained with six volumes and uh, we achieved uh, an, uh, a die score of 80%. Also for in the extended version of the paper, we also shown um, a study where we went down to one volume for training and still managed to get a dice of 70%. So this is the, the gist of this work. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to get back to me here or later in the poster session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So Jan. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead. All right. Hi, so my name is Jan Kaminski, and I'm a research assistant at the University of Copenhagen. And I would quickly like to spotlight our work titled Deep Ensemble Model for Segmenting Microscopy Images in the Presence of Limited Label Data. So as we all know, the basic assumption of the supervised learning is that our data is independently and identically distributed. However, while working with small data sets, this is not always the case. And in order to tackle this issue, we propose our version of ensemble model, which focuses on the differences within the data, in particular different modes of the data. Uh, these different modes can be created uh, based on expert knowledge or non-overlapping different raters. And uh, as it regards to the pipeline of the deep ensemble, it is based on the k-fold cross-validation for each of the data modes. Uh, the final prediction from the ensemble is created in a two-step way uh, while combining uh, the candidates. Uh, in our experiment, uh, we aim to uh, segment the interneurons in the 2D slices of the mice spinal cord. And uh, we saw an improvement of 0 0.1 in the dice score compared to the standard unit, which was trained on the whole data set. Uh, so we hypothesized that the proposed model is most useful under the non-IID data regime and that the diversity achieved by learning on different modes is achieved by learning on different modes of data distribution. Uh, this is just a quick spotlight of the work. If you have uh, any more questions, feel free to ask them in the chat and uh, come by our poster after the session. Uh, the number is K5 and uh, hope to see you there and uh, let's have a good discussion. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much, Jan. So the next one is, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Asadula. Yeah. The stage is uh, yours. That's right. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, hi, uh, I'm uh, Mohamed Asadula Tujo. Uh, I'm a PhD student at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, and I work with Professor Martin Steiner. Uh, so in this work, uh, we start, study the dynamics of a pathologic protein that is uh, a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. So the pathology protein is called amyloid beta peptide, and it travels to a brain using large scale brain network defined by white matter connectivity. So here we try to predict the future amyloid deposition given the status of the amyloid deposition at current time. So the challenge of this prediction task is that like we have a very few time point data per subjects, like uh, two or three, most of them have only two. Uh, and those data is also quite noisy and heterogeneous. So what happens is that when you apply any kind of complex neural network like LSTM or GLU, it tends to overfit. Uh, so to solve this problem, we propose uh, a proposal method where we assume that the amyloid propagation is governed by a latent heat diffusion equation. And we, uh, we train a model to predict the parameters of this equation equation uh, in our method. So we basically have two different uh, network architecture, uh, which uh, kind of handles two different kind of heterogeneity in the data. One is graph unit, uh, which basically learns the initial heat distribution uh, of the subject. 
and uh, there is detonate which basically uh, uh, which basically uh, uh, tackles the fact that different people have different uh, robustness against the disease process. Uh, so in this way, we, we can outperform the like, complex RNA based models and also other linear models. Yeah. Uh, I think That's we have to. Um, could you please wrap up? Um, sure, sure. Sorry, yeah. we have to, uh, to stay on track. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, I think that's all I have. And uh, for further discussion, come to our poster session, K6. Uh, yeah, we'll see you there. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Well, thank you for our presentation. Uh, yeah, just we have a tight schedule. Uh, so now we'll move for the questions. We actually have two questions uh, from the public for uh, uh, SUMIC and the work K4. Um, so the first question from the public. Uh, how does the MSS loss is different from NNU net deep supervision? So uh, the, in terms of the loss, it's not uh, different. It's uh, in a similar way. But in the whole architecture, there were some minute changes. So for example, in terms of um, the upsampling blocks or the batch norm, there were some minute changes. But uh, the main focus of the work was not uh, the changes of the MSS rather than the whole uh, framework of DS6. Okay, thank you. And the other question is, uh, it's about the ground truth. Um, you show an example in your paper. And so the question is, the ground truth images looks poorly annotated with a lot of noise. Uh, why? And does it invalidate the experiments or not? And it's true that myself, I was a bit uh, surprised by the, how the manual annotation looks like. So for um, for the initial work or for the training, the uh, training was uh, the training levels were created using Elastic, which was also in a semi-automated manner. So that had a lot of noise involved. The main problem was to annotate the data set, uh, like to annotate all the small vessels manually. But for the manual uh, segmentation that was done, that was for an ROI. And in that one, uh, it was done manually. And in that one, uh, then further, it was validated. So that's when the paper, you have two different um, um, dice cores at the end. One, we have the dice, which uh, was 80% dice compared against the whole uh, ground truth created with the elastic, which was imperfect ground truth. But then the ROI comparison was done for the this ROI, which was manually segmented, where also um, this particular proposed model was the best one got 62% uh, dice. Okay, okay, thanks. And that leads me to um, another question that I have, and after that we'll move to the other papers. Um, so you report on the dice, but are there uh, other relevant metrics that would be relevant for that case? Um, uh, so in the short paper, we just kept dice uh, mm -hmm. for the sake of the yeah, space. Yeah, but in the broader con context of evaluating that one, because dice is super uh, sensitive once you have really small structure, such as mm -hmm. blood vessels with high resolution. So yeah. what do you think would be like the best metric to properly evaluate uh, what you do? So apart from this, um, like we have IOU also, but it's also in a similar way of like DICE. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we are also doing in the extended version of the paper is to correspond this different DICE scores uh, corresponding to different uh, vocal voxel diameters. So mm -hmm. to have for different vessel diameters from one millimeter to say 10 millimeter, how, and then calculate the dice for each of them separately. So to see how well it's uh, the small vessel is segmented mm -hmm. and how well the larger ones are segmented. Okay. Um, so to like extending the dice, but in this uh, different resolution. Yeah, yeah makes sense. Um, I probably have more questions, but I will show up on your poster. So now I will leave uh, Max. Um, I think he has a few questions for the next paper. Thank yeah, you. Uh, thank you, Joel. And Thank you, uh, thanks uh, to the author of the first paper. Uh, there is a question in the chat um, saying that, isn't it inefficient to squeeze the juice out of even small data sets uh, by, yeah, by making it even smaller and train a large number of models on it as an ensemble? Yeah, so thank you for the question. It, it is quite interesting and that is true that we are using quite a lot of uh, computational power to, to, to train a lot of models. However, uh, the, the, the thing is that uh, we were provided with, with this uh, small number of, uh, of annotations and uh, uh, it, was, it was easier for us to find a way to, to actually uh, train uh, an efficient model 
uh, instead of uh, actually improving improving the the quality of the data. So we just wanted to make use of what we had, and uh, it did come came by the cost of the of the computational power. But uh, yeah, it, it it could be interesting, uh, and uh, it is a, a dilemma, especially that my co-author came up with the carbon uh, tracker. So uh, the, thank you for the question. <laughs> Okay, thanks. And uh, a question I had myself is, um, after reading the paper, the results suggest a superiority compared to a single unit, which I can imagine. Did you also uh, compare to an ensemble trained in a standard way? Yes, that is also a, a question that we had from one of the reviewers. Uh, we, we didn't really compare to, to the standard uh, ensembling way because we, we try to focus uh, and we're not really suggesting that it is better than the standard way of ensembling we're just uh, trying to come up with a with a new idea of how you could ensemble when your data is uh, non iad right so so then when you when you actually uh, train this on your and you have a prior knowledge of of your modes that we call them in the data where, where you actually train on those separately uh, then you will have more knowledge and you will have more information in regards to how your data is distributed and what you can actually squeeze out of it. Okay, thank you. I have more questions, but I will meet you at the poster later and sure. uh, shift the last minutes to uh, the third paper in this batch. Um, let me check if we have questions from the audience. Doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so I, I I like the idea of combining a physical process, like the, the heat diffusion uh, physical process, and a data-driven model. Um, but as far as I understand, you predict the uh, progression of this A beta a protein, I think is a protein, right? It's not my area of expertise, uh, from the baseline time point zero into the future. And I was wondering whether it's possible to also incorporate um, future time points, if, for example, if you have multiple measurements from an MRI. Yeah, sure. Uh, you can also do that, like, uh, as an input, you can also pass like, multiple time points. But in this uh, framework, we are actually using, like, all the time points. Uh, it's just that, like, we are, we are having an input, which is the initial time point, so that, uh, like, so that the model has a like uh, initial point where it can like begin its journey. Like, you know, like the idea is that like you have some initial distribution, uh, you learn some initial distribution, and just go, go on from there to predict the future time points. But during training time, we are actually using all the time points uh, because it is trained to predict uh, all the future time points in that way. So it's kind of like uh, uh, like. If you are training a linear model, like you want to predict two things, one is the slope and one is the intercept, right? Uh, so basically, this initial time point you can uh, work as an intercept, and then we go on to learn the slope uh, from all the other time points. So it's just helping the network. You can even not input anything, uh, just 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 train it that way. That will also work, but just helping the network to train better. Okay, thank you very much. We will now move forward to the next batch of papers. Um, K7 to 9, please get ready. And Lennart, start when you're ready. The stage is yours. Well, yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Lennart Barksten from the Institute of Medical Technology and Intelligence Systems at Hamburg University of Technology. Um, in our work, my colleagues and I show how incorporating defined filters into CNNs via scattering transformations can improve the segmentation performance on small ultrasound datasets. And training CNNs on small datasets usually yields rather inefficient filters that are, well, pretty much unable to extract meaningful features. The resulting models then tend to overfit and do not generalize well to unseen data. The scattering transformation is basically a wavelet filter cascade and can be interpreted as a CNN with predefined filters. But um, these filters have some yeah, beneficial properties like stability to noise and also fast energy decay. And we now combine scattering transformations with CNNs 
by inserting the scattering transformation into a squeeze and excitation block. And this squeeze and excitation block can basically be inserted anywhere into any CNN. And the resulting experiments showed that this approach indeed improves the segmentation performance. However, the, um, the positive effect decreases when we increase the data set size. And it also seems that this approach uh, works better when segmenting smaller structures like calcifications. Well, yeah, thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to discuss this in more detail in the Q&A or later in the poster session. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. The next speaker, um, please unmute yourself and start. Um, hi there. Um, my name is Raf Mahadur Himov. I'm a machine learning researcher and team lead at Zebra Medical Vision, and I'm excited to be here. Uh, so our work is entitled Learning Interclass Relations for Intravenous Contrast Phases in CT uh, with my great colleagues Amir Bar and Ayelet Axelrod Balin at Zebra Medical Vision. Um, so yeah, I'll speak briefly to the motivation of our work where in the medical imaging setting, we're often dealing with categorical clinical findings or you know, clinical indicators. Um, but it's often considered important to consider that these can represent snapshots into continuous physiological processes. Um, you know, we might be looking at stages of a disease, um, you know, or we might just be looking at something like risk stratification. So in standard classification, we typically ignore these relations that could exist between the categories when they're related by some underlying process. Uh, so we thought it might be here that we're limiting ourselves. So in our work, uh, specifically focusing on the task of intravenous contrast phases, we find that reintroducing the information about the ordinal relationships into the training process through a soft ordinal you know, target distribution actually improves the performance significantly, especially when we're looking at smaller training sets, the, one we, the ones we often find ourselves dealing with. Um, and we also propose some new approaches and show that we can actually implicitly learn the ordinal relationship between categories directly from the data itself as part of the training process. So we show there's the opportunity to benefit from the same improvements that come from encoding these relationships uh, without the need to encode strong assumptions on the network. And yeah, I look forward to your questions. OK, thank you. And I think now is the last presenter, Antian Shu. Um, you can present to us what you did. So hi. Uh... My name is Tian Shu. Uh, I'm a graduate student from NYU CDS. So in our work, we propose a new automatic method for predicting lesion segmentations that leverages existing records annotations as training data in a weekly supervised learning setting. Um, we use Deep Library Research Plus model with a ResNet 101 backbone as our encoder-decoder architecture. Um, and we further modify this architecture to add a classification head uh, I mean, add a classification head with K class outputs at the bottleneck layer to test the effect of added class labels. We also compare our method with the prior co segmentation model of Agro et al., um, especially on liver lesion segmentation and more generally on lesion segmentation in CT as well as in skin lesions from dermatoscopic images. Well, in general, we have shown that generating labels from existing weak supervision and jointly trained to segment and cluster lesions in a multi-text learning fashion allows more accurate segmentations of CT and dermatoscopic images um, while significantly reducing their training time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, now I think um, Max had a few questions to, uh, to Lenart about his paper, so we'll um, yeah, we, let's, we have approximately 10 minutes left for the questions, so let's start with K7. Uh, we have quite a few questions from the study groups, and the first one is, uh, is there an intuition as to why scattering transforms helps to generalize in low data regimes? Does it have a regularization effect? So, well, if we would take a closer look into the math, then maybe one could show that um, scattering transformations indeed provide um, features with a large informative value. And if we assume that the, um, 
the the filters of a CNN train with only a small amount of data is not capable of producing filters with such a high degree of meaningfulness, then this is maybe um, an intuition behind why this method could work. Okay, thank you. And maybe a follow-up question for this is, uh, did you perform experiments for even lower data regimes, for example, uh, performance versus number of training samples? Um, no, we did not do this so far. So the smallest training set size for the calcium segmentation was 90 images, I think, and for uh, vessel wall and lumen segmentation, it was uh, 30, no, 73 images, and this was really the, the lower bound we tested. Yeah, but of course, if we think about applying this method on applications like few shot learning or so, of course, one has to see if this also uh, works in these extremely low uh, regimes. Okay, and we have one last question from the study group, which I cannot comprehend, but maybe you. Did you think the model could be applied to Atari images? Atari like the, the gaming console? I assume. I don't know. Okay. Um, well, that's a, that's a tough one, I would say. Um, first of all, of course, we have to, to see um, in general if this method also works on other imaging mod modalities and on other tasks like classification. Um, but yeah, in general, it's a it's a quite yeah basic approach which can be inserted into any kind of CNN. And yeah, I think um, if it really helps, would be a matter of the of the structure of of, of the images maybe. Yeah, but um, I would say it could also work on Atari images. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Then I'll hand over to Joel, uh, Joel who has questions for the next author. Yeah, uh, I had a few questions to, to Rauf um, from the study group. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I personally like the way you encoded that uh, cyclical knowledge between the different stage of uh, the study. Uh, but something that came in the study group is if uh, study group, if you had tried simpler baseline, uh, like label smoothing, it seems that you do some hard encoding of the different stage uh, in the study. So did you try label smoothing even without having prior knowledge of the class order? Right. Uh, no, that's a great question. Um, it's So short answer is it's not something that we tried, but I do agree that it would make an excellent baseline. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of our first goals going in was basically to, you know, evaluate whether an ordinal encoding would be beneficial for medical imaging or our specific task. Uh, we chose a specific approach that would let us easily integrate it into the architecture and easily accommodate sort of the opportunity to learn, you know, the optimal order encoding in a, you know, efficient way. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree. Like one of the outcomes is this, of this is seeing that it performs well. I would, you know, in future work, for future work, I think it would be interesting to extend to other ordinal encoding approaches. And you know, I say that because I also think that would be interesting to compare to the baseline that you mentioned, that label smoothing, because that would very much help to understand, you know, how to attribute the benefits of, you know, this modeling approach. Okay. And the second question, I'm not really sure I'm following it, so I will read it then. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Is there a difference with ordinal classification models, uh, either performing order prediction? Right, right. So we are, in fact, building our approach on ordinal classification. So the baseline approach that, you know, we first attempt to show works well for this is, you know, the SWORD method presented in CVPR a couple of years ago. And that is, in fact, an ordinal regression or ordinal classification approach. Um, so very much when we try to introduce the ordering of the categories, we chose a specific approach to ordinal classification, but that doesn't necessarily discount other ordinal classification approaches in uh, our general motivation or the frameworks we propose. Okay, um, thank you very much for your answer. So right, I, I do invite, uh, encourage the public to, to show up at uh, your poster session. Um, and now we'll move to the last uh, paper uh, of that group and also of the day. Um, so Tianxu, I think also another co-author showed up. Um, so yeah, it was a equal contribution between you two. So you can decide who going to answer his question. 
Uh, the first question from okay. the study group is that, uh, so it seems that the clustering uh, depends on the number of class labels, K. So they were asking how to find K. Uh, I think you had a special validation set for that. Uh, so we conduct, in, in our paper, we conduct hyperparameter tuning for each data set to find the optimum K. Mm -hmm. um, but this probably is a little time consuming, especially for a new data sets. So I guess another method could be like finding the best ratio between the number K and the number of images. Mm -hmm. Um, so that we could probably spot the best K in the new data much faster. But I'm not sure whether this is um, a really promising way to find, yeah, to find the K. Yeah. No, well, to me, it seems sensible to have to do some validation to find the best one. Um, but I'm wondering if yeah. you have a different validation set first, let's say validation set one to find the optimal K. And then when you do your segmentation, you have a different validation set. Or do you reuse the same sets? For that, how do you split your data? Um, no, I think we all use the same test set, like mm -hmm. for the validation. We don't really, yeah. Okay. And um, yeah. another question from the study group was, pseudo masks are known to propagate uh, their error during weekly supervised training. Um, is there a way to pose this multitask learning as a direct loss uh, without generating pseudo labels? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you clearly. Can you repeat it? So uh, they were asking is, if there is a way to to formulate uh, your multitask learning as a direct loss instead of having some pseudo labels that you generate and then train on that. Uh, basically, uh, we post it as a classification test. Um, mm -hmm. Another different test maybe can be formulated in order not to generate those labels. Um, yeah, but we we haven't done much research in this area, so that probably could be a potential attempt, I think. Okay, and um, again, perhaps uh, go back to a more basic question. Uh, what is the main difference with respect to methods like DeepCut, uh, who also generate pseudomask? Um, I think you mentioned GrabCut as a baseline. And so I think the question is what's the difference between uh, you and deep cut if you're aware of the deep cut um, methods to begin with yeah so um, basically we do not generate proposals and rely mm -hmm. on those methods um, instead we assume we have ground truth proposals available like in our research yeah um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether that fully answered the question but um, it, like you could go to our poster session like for yeah that, that wasn't my question yeah. so if the person that okay. had that question was in the public uh, yeah i'm going to go to uh to the poster session it was an interesting paper um to begin with um and actually now we are getting just at the end i think of that uh session so thank you to all authors for their time and uh answer to all the questions uh you did great and yeah, now we'll have uh, a poster session in Gathertown that lasts for half an hour. So um, yeah, feel free to go to see the, all the authors and ask them even more questions about their great work. Okay, and yeah, we there is a clapping button, uh, it seems so. Okay, congratulations to all and have a nice day. Congratulations to all the authors and thank you all for moderating the session with me. See you later in Gathertown. Yeah, bye.